The great Russian composer Igor Stravinsky famously stated that he wanted musicians to execute his music rather than interpret it. He even went as far as to say that, quote, interpretation is the cause of all confusion, of all abuse, and of all misunderstandings in the performance of his musical scores. Stravinsky's attitude would become the prevailing view of musicians from the mid-20th century onward, extending as far as today, which we can see in today's musicians' preferences for Urtext scores and attention to the most minute details of the musical text. However, this wasn't always the case in the history of the music that we regard today as the standard canon, music of the last several centuries, which were created in much different circumstances than the musical performances of today. In this video, I'll show three examples of music from history where the composers expected something from the performers that go beyond the musical text, beyond the score. In these works, the performer uses elements of interpretation to add their own personal take to the piece, using ideas which often are not and sometimes cannot be included in the musical text of the score. In the 17th and 18th centuries, composers and performers used the principles of rhetoric in the writing and performance of music of their time. Rhetoric was the ancient Greek tradition, the art of persuasion. And in modern times, it's also known as the art of public speaking. We can compare the words of a speech to the notes of a musical score. And in the musical scores, especially in the Baroque period, many of these scores didn't have written dynamics. Dynamics we can compare to the ebb and flow of the speaker's voice. We wouldn't want to listen to someone who just spoke flatly the entire time. And by the same token, we don't want to listen to a musical performance that stays at the same dynamic level the entire time. So what do we do with this music where the composers didn't leave us with any dynamics? Well, we do what the performers of the time would have, and we devise shapes based on implied harmony, as well as the direction of the notes. If we see a strong harmony, such as a dominant chord, we might play more. And if we see a weaker harmony, such as a tonic chord, we might play less. We also might follow the line or the shape of the music. If the music goes up, we can get louder. If the music goes down, we can get softer. We can see examples of how to apply this in the second half of Johann Sebastian Bach's Prelude for solo cello and G major. In the 19th century, the priority of musicians turned away from smaller units and rhetorical gestures and more towards longer singing lines. Singing is the key word here as it became the goal of all instrumentalists to try to copy what the singers in opera houses were doing or the leader or song singers were doing at home in the salons. Portamento is a technique that was used mainly by string players and singers, but also by players of other instruments as a means of trying to take this vocal idea and apply it to played music. Portamento literally means the carrying of the voice. And you see it in string playing when two notes are connected by a glide or a slide between them. This helps imitate when a singer might connect two notes 
by singing them on the same vowel, which connects them smoothly across the note. Portamento is related to rhetoric in that it also helps describe specific gestures. You might see, for example, a moment where the music sighs and the notes fall downward. Portamento was a technique that was expected by musicians in the 19th century, but it was almost never notated into the score. In this example of an artistic study by Johannes Palashko from the late 19th, early 20th century, Palashko writes fingerings into the score for the viola player to utilize. Fingerings which often imply sliding up and down the instrument, thereby creating a portamento, but which don't tell us exactly how to create the portamento. So it's up to us as the artist to choose how to interpret these fingerings and to choose musical gestures like sighs that you'll hear at the very beginning of this excerpt, which match the intention of the composer and match the desire of us as a performer. In this last example, we'll look at a score written by a composer living today. Since the 1950s, composers who were unsatisfied with the limits of normal musical notation have experimented with options that escape this. One of those options is graphic notation. Graphic notation can be quite literally any kind of drawn notation that uses elements other than normal musical notation. In fact, sometimes it simply uses normal musical notation, but turns the score uh, into an object itself, like in the works of George Crumb. There are many composers using graphic notation still today, including my friend Joseph M. Colombo, a composer based in the San Francisco Bay Area, who goes by at Young Brahms on Instagram. His Instagram page, Young Brahms, despite its name, is dedicated entirely to graphic scores. In November 2019, he dedicated a graphic score to me called Mark the Air. In this score, rather than use no traditional notation, he uses blocks of sound. The only instructions for the performer are that each notational block is played long enough. He also says that the performer should be playing the prepared viola. And he says for the musician to mark the air with your sound, thus where the title comes from. What exactly do we do in realizing these graphically notated scores? Well, this type of notation necessitates that you do things that go beyond the score. The performer makes a choice based on what they see, and the rest is essentially improvisation. These types of scores can change from performance to performance, rehearsal to rehearsal, and that's okay. That's the intention of the composer here. In fact, when I asked Joe, well, what should I do here? He told me, you decide.
I hope these three examples have helped show you how musicians can go beyond the score. And I hope they've also inspired you to take these ideas and experiment and explore with the music you're playing.